Bismillah Rahman Rahim. All right. Assalamu alaikum, wow. Minister. Assalamu it's, it's an honor to have you. Peace and blessings, everyone that is joining us. It's been a moment, but we're back, and it's a very, very special episode. Welcome to our IG Live, Unveiling Love, <clears throat> Stories of Community and Social Change. This space is where artists, community leaders share their defining moments that shape their efforts in creating safety, solidarity, and fighting justice for a community. This podcast is part of our Love Over Fear open campaign organized by our Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Defending the humanity of immigrants, defending the rights of the incarcerated, incarcerated Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity works at an intersection of faith and social justice movements. So this campaign is a response <clears throat> to challenges faced by people of color in the Oakland. We acknowledge the root causes that disrupt safety and community collaboration. So through this podcast, upcoming community concerts, art events, we're here to create dialogue and nurture connection between the Black, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Chicano community. This again is a very special episode for me. You know, I always say that growing up in Oakland is a true blessing with its rich history of activism and diversity. You know, this campaign is about building a united front, right? Working at the intersection of faith and social movements. You know, we're also interested in artists and how they're led by their values and faith leaders. My guest today was at the very, very, very beginning of my faith. As a young girl, you know, passionate about self-determination and healing our community, I was led to my path of Islam as a Chinese Muslim artist. Um, there is a space in Oakland that nurtured me, educated me, introduce me to my spiritual teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and it is the Muhammad Mosque number 26, Oakland. And my guest today is the minister of this Muhammad Mosque 26, Oakland, representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He served in the Oakland community for over 33 years. He sat in meetings with city councils, mayors, county supervisors, state assembly, governors, members of Congress. My guest has fought against police brutality and worked to amend California laws to hold police accountable. He walked with the Oscar Grant family from the very beginning, from start to victory. He's the author of Grant Justice, Lessons Learned, Fighting for Justice in the Murder of Oscar Grant, which is really a blueprint, something we can all study and understand and learn how can we bring victory to these cases. Please welcome a great community leader, helper of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Minister Keith Muhammad, also known as Minister Abdul Sabor Muhammad. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you wow. so much. Salam. How are you feeling today? Oh, I'm good. Thank you, Allah. And it's certainly my honor to be here with you and your audience here on Instagram Live. It's my first time on Instagram Live, but <laughs> at least with a camera that I had control over. So we're yeah. very honored to be here and I pray that whatever we have to share is used to help our community to unite to grow to thrive and to secure the justice for ourselves that we deserve yes sir yes sir it's an honor to have you you know I mean you the Muhammad Mosque number 26 has been such played such a vital role and who I am today. And I know you as just a great community leader and as student minister, but I want the audience to know a little bit more about you. Um, can you share with us a bit of your background? 
what attracted you to the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Nation of Islam? Um, and what was the defining moment that inspired you to do this work? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your question. One of the things that I've learned from Minister Jabril Muhammad is that all of us that have made our ways into the doors of the mosque, that we were chosen. And so while we did in fact agree when we came into that meeting, we were seen by Allah before we walked through the door. So if I went back into my young life, being raised in Los Angeles, there was always in me a desire to see something good for black people. As a young man, when before internet, you picked up newspapers to read. My parents kept black magazines and black newspapers in our home. And as an athlete coming up in football, whenever we played, it was my habit to pick up the papers on the next day, Saturday morning, to see if there was any coverage of our achievements. And the answer generally was no. So I was always disappointed, not only in football coverage, but in coverage of the lives of black people. So as a little boy, my heart always yearned for what our people suffered. I came up when what's now known as Black History Month initially was Negro History Week, but going to all black schools there in Los Angeles, when I say all black, it probably means about 90 some percent black, which very few schools, if any in Los Angeles, are still like that. So I went to Hillcrest Elementary, which is in the jungle area of Los Angeles. I went to Audubon Junior High, which is not far removed from Crenshaw and Stalker. I went to Dorsey High, which is on the edge of West Los Angeles. And in every Every instance, when these times came for the study of the struggle of Black life, those civil rights clips that were being shown and uh, being taught about Dr. King and the struggle of Black life always touched me. You are an artist, as I understand it, and an art instructor. I never considered myself an artist, even though my mother put me in music at a young age. But I'll never forget, sister, at Hillcrest, fourth grade, they had a district-wide Black History Month art contest. The teacher gave us whatever we desired to do creatively. And I actually took a stencil of the map of the United States. My parents had all of the Ebony and Jet magazines that you could have. And I cut out pictures and pasted them on to this collage of black life in America. And fully unexpected to me, my instructor informed me that I won the district-wide art contest. I couldn't believe it because I almost flunked kindergarten with a crayon in my hand. <laughs> that wasn't my thing. But what was my thing was that I love black people. So for me, the turning point was a trip I went with my mother to Egypt in 1985 with a black scholar by the name of Dr. Youssef Benyakanan. And those that study black history and Egyptology are well aware with Dr. Ben, for he kept company with scholars the like of John Henry Clark or Maulana Karenga or Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. He was in that circle of scholarship. I didn't even know who he was. In fact, when I went to Egypt, I didn't have any knowledge of Egypt beyond what people see on television, the Ten Commandments movie. But my mom wanted that I take this trip with her, so I did. When I did, at 21 years of age, I was the youngest traveler. The rest were my parents and my parents' ages. But what opened my eyes was the realization how thoroughly I had been lied to when I thought that uh, Pharaoh looked like Yul Brenner or Moses.
poses look like Charlton Heston, these white actors whose images are still in my head displaying themselves to be Pharaoh and Moses, the children of Israel and Egypt were all painted out to be white. And if you watch that old classic film, it's one of the most classic films of all time. One of America's first big blockbuster movies out of Hollywood called The Ten Commandments. The only black characters were well in the background with plants in their hand, fanning Pharaoh, trying to keep him cool. But when I went to Egypt and met the original people, the Nubian tribes, and learned and began to learn that everything that I had been taught had been a lie in religion. That moved me so that when I made my way home, I was on the journey with a number of black scholars in addition to Dr. Ben. And when they saw this young black man, they basically mentored me on that trip and began handing me books of knowledge for the first time on a plane, flying back from Egypt, I opened up a book on a plane. I had never done that. I had flown a few times, but not with a book. In this instance, I began reading on my way home. And when I got home, lo and behold, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was on the television news, being attacked as an anti-Semite coming to Los Angeles in the face of great protest to speak at the LA Forum. I didn't know who he was at all, but I could see the hand of our enemy and their attacks against him. And right away, my heart went to him. I didn't see the speech, but my mom got the tape, brought it home, and I rode to school every day from LA to Long Beach State, running that tape until I broke the tape. I joined the Black Student Union at Long Beach State, became its vice president, well, first historian, then vice president, and eventually president. And in the midst of that, I'm growing, I'm learning. And the first event that I organized as president for the Black Student Union was to organize multiple colleges to go and see men to Farrakhan at the LA Convention Center for the meeting entitled Politics Without Economics is Symbol Without Substance. So the first time I saw the minister, we were blessed to bring a couple of hundred students. We were given special treatment, sat in the VIP section. And then one month later, we invited Minister Khalid to speak on campus at the annual Black Consciousness Conference, which still exists there in Long Beach. He was our keynote speaker. After he spoke, he wanted to speak to me. Well, lo and behold, uh, he invited me to talk with him. I couldn't give him good answers to his questions about his lecture because I really didn't listen to it. I was running the program. And when he asked me, me how I thought his lecture went. I said, it was all right. And he looked mm -hmm. a little disappointed that I couldn't tell him back what he said. I said, well, Brother Collett, I was running the program. I wasn't listening to the lecture. I'll listen to the tape. And if you want to know my opinion, I'll give it to you then. He said, well, I'll be in town a few days. If you want to get together and talk about it, here's my number. And, and we got together. When we did get together, we met at the Muslim restaurant, formerly the Salam West, run by the regional captain. May Allah be pleased with him, them both, Captain Wali Muhammad. And when I sat down to have lunch with Brother Khalid, now I had questions. But he had help in answering my questions. Not only did he know what he knew, first I appreciate that he took the time the way we're taking time right now, to even talk to me. He didn't have to do that. Now, I didn't know anything about the Nation of Islam and its structure. So at that time, so the fact that he's the national spokesman of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan wasn't moving me. But what was moving me was I had questions and he had answers. And when he felt frustrated 
Maybe he thought that he wasn't the best one to reach me. There were others in the room who came and joined us who also answered my questions. That included Minister Abdul Wazir Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with him. It included another national spokesman for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, then our minister in DC, Dr. Abdul Alim Muhammad. It included our minister, one of them in Tennessee, who was actually Minister Abdul Rashid Allah's uncle, who had written books on prayer. It included regional student captain, uh, Halim Muhammad, who was our waiter that day. And they kept me at that table it had to be three hours and when they were done i was invited to attend a mosque meeting and i did it was a friday night a new study guide had been distributed study guide i believe number 12 and i was so so impressed with the meeting itself i was impressed by the subject of self-improvement the basis for community development I was impressed by the knowledge and the sincerity of the many students that sat in circles. There must have been about eight circles out that night. About a hundred believers were there on a Friday night study group. And at the end of the meeting, we did, or it was done, was normally done on a Sunday, and that is take acceptance. Now, I may have been the only first time guest there. But thanks be to Allah, I accepted on that Friday night and have been a part of the Nation of Islam in 1987 ever since. Beautiful. All praises due to Allah. You know, I, I can understand the feeling of having your questions answered and always going back and wanting to know more. Um, and that is what your mosque did for me, my mosque 26. I was able to learn so much, but what was most memorable is the sense of safety. It was safety that, you know, I can be at the space and I can take the time, I'm at peace to learn. The sense of safety is a large part of this love over fear campaign. It's a big issue that we're discussing in the community. And when I was a guest at the mosque, I felt so safe. There was a security check, there was structure, um, and I felt respected and valued being in this space. Can you share with us how the Nation of Islam defines safety and how does it guide the way that we secure our community? Well, you know, we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that the first law of life is motion and the second law is order. Where there is order, we feel more secure from the disorder that surrounds us. So I, like you, enjoyed and still do coming through the check procedure at the MOSS meeting and coming into a structure of people who have been trained to handle us in certain kinds of ways. And when we feel secure, we're able to be one, to listen, to learn, and even to exhibit various forms of creative flow. Now, pain can be the mother of creativity, but at some point, even that one that suffered pain is gonna to have to sit down in a place of uh, quiet of mind to express whatever that was. So as an artist, you go through a painful moment, most don't tend to start painting or singing or rhyming while the pain is ongoing. After we reflect, think, then we're able to express ourselves as an artist in ways that others may not be as expressive. So the artist is one that is able to tune in to what others are thinking and express it in color express it in sound, express it with words, so that those that are enduring similar struggles can move forward because they've come to better knowledge and understanding based on what someone else expressed. So that when I attend mosque meetings, it's in that security, it's learning. But when I leave 
receive from that security with better knowledge, then I'm able to act in those moments with greater wisdom and understanding, being made more secure in who I am and where I'm going and how I intend to get there and to meet and overcome obstacles that come before me because I have knowledge that there's something beyond this situation. In the Quran, that's called the hereafter. And it says in the second surah of the hereafter, they are sure. So if I'm stopped as I have been by law enforcement, as I have been prior to our work in particular cases and afterwards, mm -hmm. I intend to live through this conflict. So I'm seeing beyond the man or the woman in law enforcement that has approached me. I'm seeing beyond the gang member or the robber or the thief that may have approached me. I'm not uh, disheveled, if you will, by their presence, though I am acting according to the knowledge and the skill that I have to survive a situation. But at the end of the day, I've got faith that no matter what they bring, that I'm going to see tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that gives us uh, the peace and contentment of mind that even when confronted by guns, well, if I must give my life, I've given it for a cause. That's right. So praise be to Allah. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. And the fruit of Islam, the men are, you know, of the nation of Islam has also provided security uh, for many community leaders and also have provided security in, in the community, right? Can you share with us a little bit more about that? In your opening monologue, you made some reference to love or per perfect love. I don't have the exact words, but I can give you the exact words of the Bible. And that is perfect love cast out fear. So when Whenever the nation of Islam has been involved with security measures that the community has come to enjoy, it begins with love of self, love of Allah, love for the people whom Allah came to demonstrate his love for. So the last thing we want to see is our people fighting and harming one another and the difference between the presence of the FOI and LAPD. Perhaps it couldn't be painted more starkly than what happened after the funeral of Nipsey Hussle. And that is the people in their love for Nipsey were out by the tens of thousands. And it was very difficult for LAPD to contain them. In fact, LAPD could not contain them. Helicopters, SWAT teams, high or uh, heavy armory, none of that could contain that crowd. And the difference is LAPD officers showed up with a job to do, but the FOI showed up with love in our hearts. And the expressed love of the FOI coupled with the fearlessness that we're taught in Islam. When you put those two things together, handling people in a way with of dignity and respect in such a great way that they return it. So now imagine bloods and crips step on your toe and say, excuse me, bruh, as opposed to what set that is, what you're doing in this hood. Those are not the responses that we tend to get. It doesn't mean that there may not be a time where someone raises his hands against us. But when hands have been raised against us, they've been met with love. So love can be gentle, but love is also very firm. And in the firmness of our love, the community has come to respect it because the community expects that if we put hands on somebody, one, it's in self-defense, and two, you must have earned it. So the community loves the fact that there's a fearless group of men and women called the Nation of Islam that will strive to be right toward the people in whatever action we are taking. There was 
uh, at one time before the government did all they could to silence our effort, something called NOI Security Incorporated, where the FOI and a few MGT that worked with them were being invited into public housing projects to make them more peaceful, to make them worthy of our respect, to make them safe for our children to play because the community recognized that when the FOI are present, that things that they fear lessen. So those that are selling drugs back away, their customers back away because of whatever shame they may feel to buy some dope in front of the Muslims or to sell their bodies in front of the Muslims because when we entertain those that are selling or using dope, we don't see them as criminal enemies. We see them as sisters and brothers that need the truth. They got us away from drugs. There are many of us that sold drugs. There are many of us that use drugs. So we knew the reality. There are many of us that pimped women or many of us who have been pimped but have accepted Islam. So when we walk into those terrains, we walk with love for the people on both sides of the activity. And the community tends to know that, tends to respect that. I'll never forget, we were in the home of Jim Brown as Minister Farrakhan had been there meeting with leaders among the Bloods and Crips. And may Allah be pleased with Big Jim. And one one of these meetings, the minister wasn't there, but I believe his staff, his son were present to meet with some of these gang leaders and it didn't go so well. We weren't able to fully execute that meeting because of the beefs that were apparent between some of the young men there. So we had to dismiss the meeting. But before that meeting was dismissed, a brother came up, up next to me who I played football against as a high school student, who I played football against as a middle school student, who I went to elementary school with. I never knew him as a gangbanger. I knew him as an athlete. But while we were in Jim Brown's backyard, lo and behold, this brother I had known for a lot of years was a gang leader. Now, now I went to Dorsey High. There's bloods on one side of the school and crips on the other side of the school, but problems never erupted on the campus. This young man said to me, we always had our eye on you, talking about me, <laughs> and we knew you would get out of this, something of that effect. And yeah, I, I had no idea you had your eye on me for any reason, right? And then secondly, your feeling that as a young man, I would survive it. Well, all praises are due to Allah that you thought highly enough of me or you hoped well for me. Because I was never a gangbanger. I was an athlete and a musician. But at the same time, growing up in that, that environment, you had to know and be willing to, if necessary, to handle your business with people who thought that they would bully you. And I just never went well with bullying. That just didn't, it, I wasn't the one sister to be bullied. So if someone came up with the mindset, I would even let them get the words out of their mouth. So if they came up and said, I'm about to kick you, like before they could get that ASS word out, my fist was on them. I just couldn't go there. I just didn't have that disposition. But at the same time, I maintained my peace. So I didn't aggress people. So folk knew that if I were locked in with somebody, then somebody started something. And it was understood, I think, by many that were my peers. And I thank Allah that in those conflicts that no one in those days carried or used weapons and most of them. So it would become really a test of whether or not you were willing to stand for yourself, willing to stand for what you believed in. Now, my mother never knew the range of potential conflicts that I ran into. However, I know one thing is like your parents and everybody else's, I was taught if somebody hits you, hit them back, back. do not let people 
bother you like that. So when now we're looking for uh, peace in the communities where we live, one, law enforcement would respect us much better if they knew that we respected ourselves. They would be much less likely to use a weapon against us unjustly if they understood that there's a consequence that will come directly from the people whom they are offending. So the nation of Islam is respected by law enforcement for that very reason. It doesn't mean that they'll not pick at, pick on, surveil, uh, make false charges against members of the nation of Islam. They've done all of that. But what they also know is if you don't uh, want to continue, don't start it because we, we will certainly defend our lives and our love is such that it causes us to be more defensive of the lives of everybody, wherever we are. So when Oscar Grant was slain and others have been slain or others have endured pain that required a loving hand, we've been there all over the country in whatever force is required to secure the peace. I'll stop on this point. Congresswoman Barbara Lee of Oakland, our wonderful sister, she was the only member of Congress who voted against the war on terrorism, a blank check that Mr. President Bush was writing. She felt that it was unjust to secure government support for a war that has not been declared, that an enemy has not been declared. And she was under tremendous threat. She was being threatened all over DC. She was being threatened all in the social media. She was being threatened in whatever ways people knew how to contact her. So I called her, Sister Barbara, is everything okay? And she told me the problem. I said, well, sister, I can call our staff in DC. We need to get, get some brothers around you. And she assured me that I guess the Secret Service or whomever would increase what they do out there. I said, well, when you come here, we got you. Because we love our people. And whether or not I agree with every policy decision of Sister Barbara, the answer is probably no but I know she's my sister. Just as Minister Farrakhan knew that Reverend Jackson is our brother and the great controversy that surrounds us right now under the false allegation of anti-Semitism comes from the demonstration of love Minister Farrakhan showed to Reverend Jackson. That when his, his life was under threat with over a hundred people locked up with real charges for attempting or planning to kill him. It was the FOI that picked him up at airports, that secured him around the country. And the enemy was so disturbed to realize that they couldn't put a hand on him without having to go through the nation of Islam. And another way of saying that is without having to go through the power of God. And they, they realized that. So when the minister warned them not to harm our brother, that if you harm our, our brother, that will be the last one that you harm and not see a reply from Almighty God, Allah. They didn't know what to do with that. They took that to be a threat. Well, it's a threat you don't, you don't have to worry about unless you're an assassin. So why would they be worried about such, except that it was clearly their plan to harm Reverend Jackson and it was clearly our plan to protect Reverend Jackson. And at the base of any protection service that we offer, it's actually love. So when we walk, walk into these arenas with no guns, no weapons, nothing but our love and the truth that's in our head, and our people understand that and respect that. So it's not that we cannot be harmed, any of us, can be harmed it, if it is the will of Allah. But our willingness to step forward, to do whatever we can to make our communities safer, the community respects.
our mosque there on Foothill. We have neighbors. There are more black businesses in those few blocks than most places in Oakland. One is a liquor store, and we don't buy liquor, but I can tell you this, the store is so happy that we're sitting right there because our presence there drove down crime on the block. There's a bakery across the street from us. You would never know that it was open because they boarded up their windows, basically, to make it appear as if there's no one in here while they bake mm. because before we moved in, they experienced high rates of crime right there on Foothill and Fairfax. And this is a Muslim owned bakery. So, so the businesses that surround us know the benefit of our presence because our presence delivers love. And finally, one day we were there in a school day. As you know, we were te teaching and are teaching our children every day. And a, we were letting the children out the front door and we opened up the door and a girl, a teenage girl, was running at top speed down the street and ran right through our front door, fearing her life, saying that some young men around the corner kidnapped her. Now, you know where this is going in Oakland. This is going toward uh, prostitution on the street. The men that were chasing her, when they saw her run into the door of the mosque, Oh, they hit an about face. They, they never touched her in our presence because even though uh, they had whatever their arrangements were with each other, we don't know the circumstance. Maybe she stole their money. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But she ran through those doors for refuge. So if nothing else, the Muslim community represents to the black community refuge in a time of trouble. That no matter what our people have endured in their daily lives, we're here to serve, not to judge, but to serve. And the greatest among us, many of them are yet in the street. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said his best followers are yet in the street. So we should not be shocked by street behavior or street conduct, but our role is to bring civility and organization and structure and righteousness into the lives of those that have fallen victim to Satan's grasp. That's right. So, right. so what I'm getting is to create safety, a sense of safety and peace um, is really rooted in this fearlessness of, of, of that's rooted in self-love and, and respect um, and that creates a community that really creates, you know, people coming to the mosque for refuge and safety. So I really believe that this is an example that we can all learn from, um, that we need some fearless folks on the, the, the front line that loves themselves, respects themselves and love our people. I love that. Thank you. Praise be to Allah. You are, again, you're the author of Grant Justice Lessons Learned Fighting for Justice in the Murder of Oscar Grant. That was in 2009. You worked with the family all the way up to uh, the victory. But during that time, we have Adolf Grimes, right, in New Orleans, uh, police shooting, uh, Robbie Tolan in, in, in Texas. You've been calling out racial disparities in the criminal justice system. It's 2024. You know, this coming Sunday, I'm going to attend a community rally for Yong Yang, uh, a Korean man that was killed by the LAPD while he was uh, suffering from a mental health crisis. Um, we're grieving, we're in pain to what happened with our sister, Sonia Massey. I mean, it's so many years later and I feel like we're in the same place. It's a very similar place and we're celebrating the fact that Kamala Harris is running for president. But back then, there was celebration for inauguration for Barack Obama, right? So, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on how we could progress, not feel like we are in the same situation years later? Any thoughts on what we could do moving forward? Well, similar to what I said before, and that is, is the acts 
that have occurred against our people would lessen greatly if those who are committing such acts knew that there was a consequence to pay for the acts that are being committed. Our sister, I think in Springfield, Illinois, who called for law enforcement because she feared an intruder or something outside of her home. But that officer had, had no regard for her humanity, saw her as less than a dog, so that she came under the threat of that officer. He knew his intention. When he turned off his camera uh, that officers carry, it was caught on film by the other officers who did not have his intent which was clearly to abuse our dear sister. She did not deserve what she got. But when that officer is confronted by law, we'll see whether or not the system of jurisprudence actually will work in our favor. In the case of Oscar Grant, that was the first time in the history of the state of California that a cop had even been charged with killing people unjustly. And thanks be to Allah for the many activists, you asked about activism earlier, who helped us drive that train right into the office of the district attorney's office, the mayor's office, the governor's office, everywhere you went where people were crying for justice in the murder of Oscar Grant. And because of our united organized effort, then the forces of government could not resist, especially if they desired to return to an office in government. So the district attorney of Alameda County, he had been in office for 20, 30 years. This man convicted Huey Newton, name is Tom Orloff. He was a DA pursuing Huey Newton in the 70s. Now we're in 2009 and his brother officer had killed Oscar Grant. He would not have brought charges if he didn't fear that the united effort of the community was gonna press the button. There were enough black elected officials in Oakland at that time who lent their voice of support for justice in the murder of Oscar Grant. In other words, when that cop pulled that trigger, he didn't calculate that there's a trigger in the hands of the people. And when the people agreed to organize themselves, they accepted, and we respect our community so much for this. They allowed members of the Nation of Islam to take a lead role. It reminds me when Minister Farrakhan made the call for the Million Man March, some were disturbed saying, Farrakhan, you don't do marches. We do marches. We're the civil rights people. Well, you do, but you didn't have the goal that we set before us at the Million Man March. Similarly, in this drive for justice, yes, there are others that have uh, done many great things. But in this moment, it took the drive of God to walk in that door and drive the DA. And with the collective effort of the community, we actually suggested to the DA, either you bring charges against this officer or you should retire, you can resign, or you're gonna face a recall of the voters of the people of Alameda County. A week later, he resigned and he brought charges against Johannes Mesley. So they had not seen the power of unity come from every walk with a Muslim face on it. Mm -hmm. I was in the elevator going to see the DA with one of the greatest pastors in America from the Allen Temple Baptist Church. He's a legendary Baptist preacher by the name of Dr. J. Alfred Smith Sr. He was pastor pastor to Huey Newton and others. So I'm a young, when that happened, I'm a child. And he was their pastor. And now he's my pastor. But while we were on the elevator, he's retired now. But while we were on the elevator, 
Pastor Smith leaned his head on my shoulder and broke down and cried because this call for justice led by younger than he, stronger physically than he, spiritual men, it touched his heart. Perhaps he could see the victory coming. And this had been what he appeared to have been waiting for for many days in his life. Now, we didn't know it. We were just there in the time. We were guided by the hand of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who told us to do what we knew how to do. Well, what is that? It's whatever Allah blessed us with to organize as a plan to serve the rise of our people. So, you know, each of us bring what we bring. Each of us is the chosen of God. You got something in you that only needs to be mined and harvested and put to service. And whatever that is, Allah has chosen for you. So the scripture says all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We didn't make the call. We answered the call. That's right. Now we called Minister Farrakhan and he gave Brother Rashid Allah and myself instruction of, of what not to do. <laughs> so thanks be to Allah. He didn't tell us what to do. He told us what not to do. That's guidance. Don't go too far in this direction. Don't go too far in that direction. Stay in this course and you will do well. And Allah blessed us in that drive to see charges brought. But in terms of what would slow down the hand of an enemy, well, a beast respects force. But the force force that we offer is not the force of our hand, it's the force of our love, and the force of our love will direct the force of our hands. Beautiful. Beautiful. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad demanded um, that we want justice, equal justice under, under the law. We want justice applied equally to all, regardless of creed, class, or color. And he also taught us that our unity is more powerful than an atomic bomb. This campaign, Love Over Fear Oakland, is about nurturing connections and creating dialogue between the Black, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Chicano community. In the most honorable Elijah Muhammad taught that we're all family, right? So how do we cultivate this unity, this racial solidarity during these times? One of of the greatest barriers to unity we're taught as students of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is communication. We cannot unite if we cannot talk. Agreement is the basis of love. So for those communities that we may not be as well acquainted with, once we get acquainted, it becomes a love fest. So you'll see that in Oakland, even in the murder of Oscar, it wasn't simply black people involved in the protest, it was everybody. And in fact, Oscar's own family life included a mixture and his friends of black, Asian Pacific Islander, Filipino, uh, Latino. There was a group there and all of them respected the principles for which we made our call for justice. So we don't have to agree <clears throat> on all forms of cultural expression. We don't have to. We don't have to agree on languages. We don't have to agree on religion. But what we should agree on is the principle of justice. And once we start walking this course together, you'll discover that when the next challenge comes, that we're more willing to walk together again. So those that have been meeting in Los Angeles, there at Moss 27, that you've delivered, many of them, to join the meeting with Minister Abdul Malik Saeed Mohammed, that when a call is made where a need needs to be met, then once we get acquainted with each other, then our hearts are more inclined toward each other. So if I, I call this group or this group calls me and we know each other, we're coming. 
we've got enough respect for the call and the caller that it continues in our effort. Now, in the end game of this is that we're going to have to find a way to do something for ourselves and be less reliant on our enemy for all matters of justice or all matters of community development or all matters of economic development. At the end of the day, can the Chinese and black community work together toward economic equity? Yes. Can the Korean and the black community work together for matters of political and economic progress and equity? Yes. But it does require communication. White supremacy is an idea that is pervasive, not only among white people. I heard the minister say, let me see if I can find this quote. I thought this was very interesting, the way he said it, about the mind of our people. Give me a second. I wrote it down somewhere yeah. on, on a note. Here it is. Brother Oman says, yes, we can. Absolutely. Praise uh, be to Allah. For those this, is what, this is what he said. The minister said, all of us are functioning white people. Now, we're talking about a thought process now. So if I'm a black functioning white person, and if you are an Asian Pacific Islander functioning white person, and if I meet a Latino or Latina functioning white person, what this is to offer is that the idea of white supremacy and black inferiority is in our hands. It's so we still are at a constant battle to gain a knowledge of self. But when we gain this knowledge of self, one, I walk into door the door with greater confidence in me, so it's not as easy for you to insult me, <laughs> right? Now, at the same time, when you have the same improved knowledge, it becomes more difficult to be an insulter of others. You and I are original people. And to the original people of God, there is no birth record. In fact, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad described us all as the black nation, all except for the rebellious devil. So now we simply need to communicate more. But we do have to work our way through the stereotypes, the misunderstandings, the disinformation campaigns. There have been immigrants that have come to America and have been warned to stay away from the black community or to treat the black community certain ways. These, some of these facts have come out over the years. Even our Muslim brothers. Can you imagine as a Muslim woman going into a store hopefully not in a liquor store, but a liquor store, and they see you in your head wrap and ask you, are you a Muslim? Well, how's a man selling pig feet whose name is Habib or whatever, Muhammad, but he's selling pig feet on this counter, tobacco on that counter, X-rated videos behind the counter. He has no right to ask you anything of religion. So just because he speaks the Arabic language doesn't make him a better Muslim. But when you've been sent to America or migrated here, looking for what the minister described as America's mammary gland, that community that's feeding everybody its money. So if the Arab sets up store in the community, we feed them our money to buy whatever it is that's being sold. If the Korean is there, sets up shop, we're feeding them our money. We've been made into the world's mammary gland. But you know, the mammary gland is the gland of a woman and women should all be respected. So should not the black dollar and the people that are spending it be respected? But if we don't know each other, we may may not even realize how we've been turned 
turned into functional white people. That when we see each other, we see each other as less than who we really are. So it really just takes relationship, communication, revelation of truth, and acceptance of truth when it comes. I'm speaking in principle, but in reality, if we just took the time to get acquainted with each other, when you and Sister Vivian came to Moss 26, I don't know if we ever had a conversation about being Chinese. You're just my sister. Now, you may bring it up or it can come up from time to time, but it wasn't as if there's going to be one teaching for the Chinese women and a different teaching for the black men or the black women or the Latino men or the Latino women. The truth is the truth. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad went as far as to teach that this teaching in other parts of the world would take root much faster. So if you took this same message into the Caribbean, it would pick up a following at light speed because it's needed. Same would be true in any other part of the world. And I'll close with this, sister. There's a restaurant in Southern California that I've visited a few times and I've always enjoyed how well we're handled by its staff and owners. It's called China Islamic. Now I grew up in LA. I never knowingly had ever met anybody that was Chinese and Muslim. So it was like an oxymoron, China Islamic. I didn't know there was more than a million Muslims in China at the time. So we went to go and dine at this wonderful restaurant. There used to be two of them. And when we got, got there to meet Chinese waitresses, happy to see black men in bow ties walking in the door, not grasping at their purses, worried about a thief coming in the room, but giving us the greetings and feeding us wonderfully prepared meals. And so respect comes when we get acquainted with each other. We learn one another's struggle and sojourn. And when we rid ourselves of that functional white man, that walked in the door when we became citizens of America or when we were born and raised here trying to live a life in the American way. The American way for us is slavery, suffering, and death. And it's not a way that we should choose. I'll close with this. The scripture says, I've set before you two signs, one of life and a blessing, the other of death, and a cursing, choose life that both you and your seed shall live. What Minister Farrakhan gives us is a teaching of life. And if we take to the guidance, then we can follow that guidance from him, from the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in any part of the world. So whether we are in China, whether we are in Japan, whether we are in Ghana, whether we are in Egypt or Brazil or Mexico or Cuba, wherever we go with this truth and share the truth as it's been given with us, then we're able to survive and to not only survive, but to thrive with those that would resonate to the sound of that truth. One year I was in Mexico had never been before, somewhere near Tijuana. And I'm walking down the street, Rosarito. I'm walking down the street and there's a man that appeared to be a homeless on the sidewalk. And as I walked by, I didn't even take a suit and bow tie with me. This was a vacation. Do you know this man stopped and gave me the greetings? Now I'm walking down Mexico. I don't speak hardly any Spanish. And he spoke in Arabic, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Why, alaikum salam. I'm double taking this. I'm not in South Central. I'm not in Oakland. I'm in Mexico. See, our people, when we learn of Muslims and Islam, we respect Muslims and Islam. Our role as students in this teaching 
is to share it with our people, not only with our mouths, but most importantly, with our example. Prophet right. Muhammad said that he only had two things to give, the book and his example. Right. How we treat people will determine how we teach people. Um, the, the, you know, when you speak of the truth, you know, just as I'm like learning on what the truth is, learning through my history, listening to my spiritual teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I found out so much about my history that tied me to the global family. You know, I realized the first mosque ever built in China was in Guangzhou, where my, where my family is from. And then I saw the, the commonalities and the relationship between, you know, the Chinese and the Black Power movement, you know, in, in, in Oakland. Um, you know, we, we worked together in solidarity against injustices, you know, in the 60s. And I think that there's been, you know, an, an attempt to divide us. And I almost feel like we were almost separated. You know, in the 60s, we were almost together, right? Like fighting together, especially in the Bay Area. And then we kind of um uh was was separated so these this the 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 journey to seek truth has really i have experienced um brought me a bigger family in my world and building better relationships i have to ask this question i always ask this question in the last few moments of um the interview if we did a public presentation and we're going to take off the veil of love to you. What does that look like? What will it have? We take off the veil. What does the face of love look like to you? Well, my mother's image comes to my mind because my mother's expression of love with me wasn't from hugs and kisses and expressions that say I love you. It was from action. And I've heard our beloved minister say, love is as love does. And as a student of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he would include expressions of love in so many of his messages until the Honorable Elijah Muhammad talked with him about what love meant. And he asked him, what does love mean? And then the messenger gave him an answer that included that love is built from the essentials of freedom, justice, and equality. So love is not simply some affectionate feeling that we have one for another. It's really rooted in the principles that we have for each other that allows every human being to freely express the goodness of their nature, freedom, to be given justice, fair treatment, a system of fair dealing, that as it is done for one, so it is to be done with others, not a system of uh, how do you say, privilege, but a system of fairness, a area of equality that gives us each equal opportunity as the program of the muslim says the best in civilized society that's what we want for ourselves for others and for the world so love is expressed not by our mouths but love is expressed best by what we do so what does that look like? I don't know. We just have to take out some video cameras and start recording. <laughs> and if we're involved in these deeds of good, then it'll come out on the record. The Quran says, as I close, Surah 103, the basis for the 58-week series that Minister Farrakhan delivered, I would encourage everybody to get at media.noi.org. The series is called The Time and What Must Be Done. And it is rooted in the Surah 103, al Asr, The Time, where Allah says, by the time, surely man is in loss, except those who believe and do good. 
and enjoin one another to truth and enjoin one another to patience. This is our role. This is our goal. And if that were being recorded, to me, it would show love. That's right. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And for anyone that have some questions for Minister Abdul Sabor, this is the time to type it in the comment section. Uh, Minister Abdul Sabor, is can we still purchase that book? Yes, you can actually find it on Amazon. So it, it, I may not say Abdul Sabor, just type the title of the book, and you can get an ebook or a print edition book through Amazon. If you are a Kindle customer, you get it for free. But if you want to buy the, the ebook, if you're with Kindle, you can download it and read the PDF or just go and type in the title of the book, Grant Justice. I don't think it will say Abdul Sabor. It will likely say Keith Muhammad, which was my name at the time of the writing of the book. Beautiful, beautiful. And if someone want to reach out to you, um, where can they where can they do that? Well, since we're on Instagram, then you can just direct message me or make a comment right here on Instagram to find me. Also, you can find me on Facebook. And of course, you can always contact the MOSS. The MOSS has a web page that has a communication stream in it. So if you are interested in knowing more about Islam, especially those in the Oakland area, you should go to www.noi dash oakland dot o-r-g that's www.noi dash oakland dot o-r-g you can even join our application and platform and that will allow us to communicate there's a chat program in that web page and so if there's a question that you have or you like to attend the meeting we're happy to share with you all the information we have Yes, praise be to Allah. I know you're such a busy, busy person. Thank you so much for taking time today to share with us your insight, your guidance, your thoughts. Again, this is a very special episode for me. It's like full circle. I think uh, the first time I came to your mosque and then the, the woman I am now has been, it's been a great, beautiful, beautiful journey. So I, and I thank you. Thank you for all the work that you do for our community. And, you know, like they say, like what E40 said, I'm loyal to my soil. So <laughs> I'm here to play, but my heart is always in, in the Bay Area in Oakland. Thank you for all that, that you do. And everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, until next time, I hope uh, we will start these conversations, right? Start to build with one another and continue to have the conversations we have like right now, right? Have a safe and blessed day. Thank you again. Salam alaikum and Shabdul Sabor. Wa alaikum salam. Peace and blessings everyone. See you soon.